Up next is Velo Maki, an adventure travel apparel company that builds premium quality gear for mobile professionals. Each piece is carefully considered and tested for high speed travel. Never once to follow the status quo, they continually seek out the best craftsmen and the best materials from the best factories around the world, creating a product that drives the category forward. Let's take a sneak peek. Tell us more is founder Kevin Murray. Welcome, Kevin. Hey, everybody. Thanks for having me. Um, like you said, I'm Kevin Murray. I'm the founder of Elamaki. So we're uh, we are essentially we're a, a performance-driven lifestyle brand that builds premium gear for all forms of travel and extreme environments. So what that means is we're really obsessed with how people move and travel and how they work, play, and explore in this world this is changing so dramatically around us. Um, when we founded Velamaki, we were looking for, um, uh, you know, the, the core niche market to, to, to initially go into. And since we're at our core, we're a travel brand, we started with the most extreme form of travel, which is motorcycle. So it's the only form of travel where you're exposed to all the extreme elements uh, at high speeds. So starting with motorcycle, we started taking a look at that, and um, uh, it was it was interesting. It was a very archaic industry, to be honest with you. The they they were very heavily focused on their core demographic, which was boomer males, and uh, basically their the average age of motorcycle riders was aging. I mean, we were at fifty two, I believe, was the average was the average age. It was very old as far as your primary customer base. So the industry itself was in an enormous amount of transition. There was a ton of opportunity to drop in there. It was a 12 billion, it still is, it's a $12 billion um, uh, global market for motorcycle accessories and apparel. Um, so it's very ripe for disruption. So we wanted to go in and really stake uh, a claim and, and identify with younger consumers. And, and um, we identified that the, that the industry itself is facing three primary changes that were disrupting everything about their old way of doing business. Um, the first was technology and the onset of electrical motorcycles and bicycles. Um, the second was demographics. So like I said, they were very focused on the boomer generation and they had done very little to reinvent their product or their stories or their culture um, to kind of appeal better to younger generations. And then the third is the culture. And so because it was started by the motorcycle industry, they were really focused on what people rode. So they really defined the, the industry in four different silos, which was street, dirt, adventure, and cruiser, which had no bearing on um, younger riders and, and how they viewed motorcycles and, and what they were doing. So um, as a solution to that, when we came in, we started to identify ways that we were going to be able to attack this this point. We really focused in on the old way of how they were creating the silos, and we kind of threw that off. And, and because it wasn't about what people were writing, but why they were writing. So we really took a hard look at younger writers, and we identified three primary categories. So cafe, camp, and commute. And cafe was all about... Um, uh, community, DIY, um, self-expression. Uh, camp was about escape and exploration and discovery. And then commute was talking more about the utility of motorcycles and scooters, um, the lower carbon footprint, the cheaper gas and parking, and the healthy alternative to public transportation, especially during COVID. Um, so we kind of really dialed in our stories and our culture based around that, and we took off. Um, the traction that we gained, uh, you know, after launching in 2016 um, in Hood River um, was, uh, you know, we basically doubled revenue year over year, um, reaching a million dollars before COVID impacted our supply chain. 
and we went without product for nine months <laughs> this year. So um, that took us a hit. We dropped down to, but we did we did squeak out about a half a million this year um, in 2020. Um, but the good thing that I saw was our on you know with, without product, obviously you don't have budget. You don't have budget for PR. You don't have budget for advertising. You don't have a budget for anything. So we went fairly quiet, especially compared to the previous three years where we were just on a rocket ship. And despite that, our uh, the brand continued to grow in popularity and our sales, our Q4, when we finally did get, uh, we got a loan and we, we ended up buying about a thousand units initially. And we sold through those in December. We landed in November. They were sold by the time the plane landed. We saw that happen. We, we integrated another PO, landed that like right around Christmas, December 24th. And we've only got about 10% left of that. So, so our sales on Q4 anyways, when we have had product, we did about three times the revenue we have in previous years. So our traction, what that tells me is, is that the brand is continuing to gain an enormous amount of traction. We've been trying to manage the scarcity a bit, um, but the overall COVID situation has really pushed the market into our position, luckily. I mean, for us anyways. <laughs> so um, the other great thing about it, that the, the tra early traction that we gained was um, we got on the radar of kind of industry titans like um, Yamaha, DJI Drones, Yoshimura, Keanu Reeves has been walking around. If you Google Keanu Reeves and motorcycle, you'll you'll see him walking around with a ton of our gear. Um, that led to into relationships with his company, Arch Motorcycle, and we've got some relationships with um, high end Porsche developers. All in all, the brand itself has really um, has really gotten a substantial hold on that premium product level. Our next step now is what we're preparing for is this. $20 billion kind of pent up um, aspect of travel, which is gonna be heavily focused on camping, staying local. No one's getting on an airplane, I think for 2020, not, not a lot of people. I think we'll start 21. I think we'll start to see more in 22 and 23. I think in 21, we're still gonna see kind of this, I think even a bigger surge than we did last spring down here in places like Bend, where people are trying to get away. So that fits in perfectly with our positioning and, and where we're at with Velomaki. And what I want to do is take you through the product real quick. I'll just show you um, some of the innovation and stuff that we've kind of been able to integrate, which has given us a substantial kind of placeholder in the market. Our goal is to really win the trust and respect of our customers and the, in carry gear. And then we earn the right to kind of sell them everything that goes in it. So from technology, um, accessories, tech accessories, to grooming, to fitness, anything for life on the go, we kind of earn that right. So um, we'll be able to expand out our product categories from there. But, the, but our core focus right now is really honing in on that carry gear market. So real quick, this is our tri-point harness system. So a big focus from a product standpoint that we wanted to focus in on was when you have a traditional two-strap system that is preformed, it pins your shoulder back. You really got to tighten it down and it pins your shoulder back. It's like locking up your upper body. When you're steering a motorcycle in particular, you have to get off the bike and be able to steer it. So you need a lot of upper body movement. And it's just like snowboarding, skiing, or ice climbing. Um, you need a lot of upper body movement. So what we did was we built a tri-point harness system that articulates in three points two here, and then this magnetic coupler, which goes right here. So you get it anywhere close and it just locks right in. And the great benefit of that is not only because it's super cool, um, but uh, yeah, you, when you're wearing a motorcycle or skiing or, or doing any kind of athletics, you have gloves on and you also have a full face helmet. So you can't see and attach anything. So by having that magnetic coupler down there, really separated us and, and put us apart. Um, it's a really interesting thing. Everything that we do is built for speed. So all the cam buckles and whatnot, all the straps are doubled back on top of themselves. So there's no loose straps. We also are still the only brand that has an integrated um, action camera uh, mount. So we have a GoPro mount camera right here on the face, which gives you an excellent position. The other thing we did was we integrated a waterproof battery pocket to wear on the side right here in your base of your lumbar, you can carry a full waterproof or a waterproof 
selection for a large battery pack that can change charge all of your accessories, both inboard and outboard. Um, but it also we also cable ran so that you can charge your GoPro, your phone, your communication devices all on the go. So the integration of technology and the way people live was really critical and important. I think a lot of our competition, although they were driven down to the $79 and $150 price points, what they were doing was basic, because carry gear wasn't their focus, they were basically taking school bags and putting logos on them. Um, what we did is we kind of really reverse engineered that we brought in our price point starts at um, our top of the line product is about $300. And despite that, despite being close to three times our competitors market, when we launched on revzilla.com, which is kind of the Amazon of motorcycle accessories, within four weeks, we captured first, second and fourth position of best selling packs. Like we completely decimated the established market. Um, because they had never seen anything like this and the quality and the performance was was there so anyways from a product standpoint that kind of drives in um where we're at in our differentiator um i think in summary you know this year in particular we've seen over 50 percent increase in direct-to-consumer sales um covid has positively impacted our business overall uh building an estimated 20 billion dollar pent-up demand that i think we're, we're getting ready for kind of a surge and um, uh, our positioning and building lifestyle brand based around motorcycle, bicycle, adventure travel, and overland travel has really positioned us to perform well in kind of this COVID and post-COVID economy, at least for the next three years, um, before the general international travel business picks up again. So uh, we're preparing for a crowdfunding event in April, um, looking to build our direct-to-consumer team and resources for a Series A in December. Um, so if any of you have any resources in those areas, we'd love to connect. Um, and uh, please feel free to contact me directly if you have any additional questions about the brand or um, getting involved with Velomaki. Really appreciate the time. It's great, uh, great being here. And uh, thank you very much. This is this is great, Kevin. I mean, shocker. Sure. I'm I'm I don't ride motorcycles. I know it's gonna come as a big <laughs> shock to everybody at home. Uh, but even I can appreciate how thoughtful you all have been in designing these products. It's really, really impressive. I'm wondering what you're most proud of at this point. Most proud of? Surviving. <laughs> We're at four years and uh, uh, it's it's been kind of wild. You know, like we came off really well and I could see where our PR investment in PR did really well. It kind of laid the groundwork. Most Most advice came to us about invest in PR later on. But because the market was so fragmented and building wholesale relationships initially was was kind of challenging, we we decided to build in PR and that really laid the groundwork for everything else. But um, for us, I mean, literally now just surviving and being we just went back to blocking and tackling as soon as, soon as COVID hit. We we had tried a bunch of stuff over the initial three years and this COVID really allowed us to kind of take a look and analyze, because we're not a very big team. Right now we're about three people. Um, and so it, it gave us a chance to kind of regroup and get back to what was working, analyze our data, and now kind of recreate um, a new path moving forward. Because over these last four years in particular, there's been so much change in algorithms and social media and advertising. It's, it's, it's been incredible. Um, so yeah, I would say just surviving. <laughs> Yeah, you're here. Well, I, I salute you and, and um, well done. Uh, so I know you mentioned that we can get the product online. Is there anywhere people can find these in a storefront or, or where's the best place to really get to know the product line? Yeah, so, so our whole biz, wholesale business is, um, is growing well. I mean, we're in, we're in all the top Ducati stores. We're, we've kind of positioned ourselves mostly with wholesale, um, you know, as far as a place where you could just walk in and buy with just core, we have direct relationships with all of our retailers. Um, with motorcycles, similar to bicycle, there's this huge layer of uh, distributors. And it's an ancient archaic model of putting reps in cars and driving around and shaking hands and opening doors. And the distributors have essentially carved out about 35 to 40% margin within that. So They've been stacking up. As a result, you know, your product really has to, you have to have a different mindset to go into that distributor model. And that distributor model is caving. 
Um, so from a wholesale standpoint, we've been focused really on direct to consumer, uh, well, direct direct relationships with globally with our wholesalers. You can go to our website and see where, where we're located. But direct to consumer is probably the best as well as revzilla.com, which is the largest um, uh, motorcycle retailer um, in, in the US. And then we're just finishing up, we've just, our China business has just grown exponentially um, uh, just over the last several months. So that's been going really well. We're looking at, we're, we're focused on China right now and Europe and the UK with Brexit and whatnot. We're trying to, we're trying to navigate that waters. We've got um, Southeast Asia and um, Australia still that are, that are enormous markets for us that we'll probably tackle in um, 22. Great. That's great. That's great. Okay, so RevZoom was that right? RevZoom. Rev yeah, RevZilla. Yeah, I don't. I didn't. Zoom, <laughs> Zoom machine. <laughs> what? Okay, so RevZilla and uh, Velamaki.com, and then um, where are the products being produced, Kevin? Uh, everything's built in in uh, Vietnam. So I was the design director for a number of years um, for the North Face. And so I built up their programs as well as I ran an independent design firm. So I've been doing this for about 30 years and I had kind of my pick and choice of all the top manufacturers. So I really, I was, I saw a lot of the challenges that we had in China, um, uh, both culturally and then also just the relationship between the U.S. So this is about five years ago. I, I was really focused on building our um, our, uh, our product line lineage in um, based in, in Vietnam. So everything right now is based there. We have we source products and, and materials all over the world and all throughout Europe and Italy and Germany and Korea, but everything is manufactured in Vietnam. Great. Uh, we have an interesting question from the audience. Do you have IP protection or a patent on the three-point strap design or the magnetic clasp protecting your design? Yeah, so we have we have trademark design all over the place. We started some IP on the uh, the harness but uh you know when we look at the investment of um you know trying to protect that not only get it uh and establish it but protect it uh we are we're kind of looking at doing that on our next round of investment we've got some modifications to this system that will make it much better that will probably end up patenting that that aspect of it but um yeah just trying to get a startup and grow everything and then drop 15 20 grand that's just for us and then you've got china patents and all that stuff it's um it's challenging we did trademark the brand everywhere heavily um but uh but uh, as far as ip goes especially with soft goods um you know you literally have to have a stitch for stitch um rip off uh if they just vary it just a little bit um they can completely get around uh the patent and with soft goods in particular it's uh it's um, it's a you just you've got to be able to have a serious war chest to be able to defend something like that. Yeah, and, sure, uh, sure. So until we until we get there, we already have we've kind of been keeping some of our newer technology under wraps so that we can patent that um, as newer stuff comes out and be able to protect that. But we it's it's a really important strategy that you have to build around. Um, and you know, as a startup, we just didn't have the war chest to to be able to do that. Um, we've taken initial funding round from Roundhouse, um, and uh, and so so that's that's been an excellent relationship that we've built um, uh, over the last three years. And now what we're doing is that was kind of a seed round, and now we've kind of gotten ourselves established and and everything dialed in. And so, like I said before, we're looking at um, opening up a probably a Series A in December or Q1 next year. So well, that's just great. I love this update. I love what you're doing. And I'm wishing you the best of luck and um, stay in touch with us. Let us know how it's going. Okay, Kevin? Great. Will do. Thanks, Thanks for coming. Thanks so much. Yeah, you got it.